All right, welcome back everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about the different advanced cardiac life support treatment options that we have at our disposal. So essentially, we've looked at the EKG in isolation now. Now we're going to correlate it to a patient, and we're going to say that when we have patients that present with certain signs and symptoms, in addition to the EKG finding that we've seen, there's going to be a specific set of, of uh, algorithms that we're going to follow for that patient. So I like to break it down into uh, some very simple approaches because at the end of the day we can talk a lot about uh, some very complicated things and they're not very useful for the out-of-hospital provider. So let's take a look at this and I want you to appreciate that if you can answer uh, a couple questions you're going to know exactly what you need to do for this patient. So first thing you want to know is is the rhythm fast or slow? All right, that's the first thing you're going to look for. So is it fast or is it slow? Next thing you want to ask yourself is, is the patient stable or unstable? Right, and we're going to define these things in just a second. Next you want to know is, is the QRS duration narrow or wide? All right, again, we'll define that in a second. And then last but not least, is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? All right, so let's take a look at these features. So when we talk about a fast or slow rhythm, we're gonna simply define something that's slow as less than 60 and fast greater, well, let's call it 100 and 100 or 150. We'll talk about those in just a little minute. Stable or unstable, let's do this. Let's call stable BP greater than 90 systolic and we'll th that'll be stable and unstable we'll say can be the blood pressure less than 90 or severe signs and symptoms of shock so if the patient is unconscious if the patient has crushing ischemic chest pain if the patient is severely short of breath as a result of the rate then we're gonna say that patient is also unstable even if their blood pressure is above 90. Narrow or wide, we're talking about the QRS duration. It's gonna be narrow if it's less than 120 milliseconds. Whoops. And we're gonna say that it is wide if it is greater than 120 milliseconds. So after all that work we've done to try to figure out whether or not it's exactly 80 milliseconds, 60 milliseconds, it doesn't really matter because we either want to know if it's narrow or it's wide in the end. All right, next we want to know, is the patient symptomatic or asymptomatic? That is different than if the patient is stable or unstable. You can have a patient with a completely normal blood pressure, as we mentioned up here. They could have a blood pressure of 110 over 60, but they could have crushing chest pain, be very diaphoretic, be extremely short of breath, all because their heart rate is 20. So patient symptomatology is very important. We want to know, do they have symptoms or not? All right, does the patient <clears throat> have symptoms or not? And then we also need to know, are these symptoms related to the rate? All right, oftentimes it's going to be a rate problem that's causing all these other things because the rate is going to directly impact cardiac output. So let's take a look at our options here. So you start your flow chart. We're going to look at the slow stuff first. All right. The next thing you want to break out is, is the patient stable or unstable? All right. So this is going to be our stable and unstable category. If the patient is unstable, here are the things we want to do for them. If they have a slow heart rate and the patient's unstable, so we're going to say a rate less than 60, and unstable means hemodynamic compromise. Let's just call it BP less than 90 or severe signs and symptoms of shock. The first thing we want to do if it's available is perform transcutaneous pacing. If that's not readily available or if that doesn't work, the next thing we want to try is the administration of dopamine. And dopamine is going to be administered at a 2 to 10 microgram per kilo per minute dose. Again, either if you don't have dopamine or if dopamine's not working, another drug that can be considered is epinephrine and epi, also 2 to 10 micrograms, but it is per minute. It is not by, volume, uh, by weight. So be careful here. 
be very careful. This is two to 10 mics per kilo per minute for dopamine. For epi, it's two to 10 micrograms per minute. Now remember, this is not Montgomery County or Maryland standard. We do not give epi drips in Maryland. However, you need to know it for national registry and it is absolutely an ACLS uh, algorithm possibility. All right, so this is pretty much the only thing you need to know for unstable slow rhythms. If they're unstable and it's slow, we do pacing, we give dopamine, we give epi. All right, now let's take a look at the stable side of things. Stable side, we're gonna further break down into narrow. And we're also gonna break this down into wide. So this is a cool little chart you need to think about and keep in the back of your head here. All right, under narrow, we gotta break down, is it symptomatic or asymptomatic? All right, so under the symptomatic column, if we have a slow, stable patient with a narrow EKG, but the patient is symptomatic, then we wanna do transcutaneous pacing. If transcutaneous pacing is not available, atropine. And we give that at 0 0.5 milligrams. And we can give that up to three milligrams total dose. If that doesn't work or we need something more, we're gonna give dopamine. If that doesn't work or we need something more, we're gonna give epi. And those are gonna follow exactly the same dosages as we had over here. For the asymptomatic patient, I don't care how slow their heart rate, so long as they're stable and their EKG, uh, their QRS complex is narrow and they're asymptomatic, then what I want you to do is I want you to vomit the patient. All right, we're gonna do vital signs. We're gonna give oxygen if needed. We'll monitor the patient, meaning put them on the EKG. We'll start an IV and we'll transport the patient. All right, vomit your patient. Vomit the patient. All right, cool, so that's pretty easy. All right, let's take a look at your wide guy. Wide guy, asymptomatic. Wide guy, symptomatic. If they're asymptomatic, what are you gonna do for them? You got it, vomit. Remember, if they need oxygen, if, they, if their uh, SpO2 is less than 94%, or if they're having signs of problems, but they shouldn't be because you put them under the stable category. If they're symptomatic and they have a slow, wide rhythm, we're gonna consider atropine. If that doesn't work, we're gonna consider dopamine. If that doesn't work and they start to deteriorate, we're gonna do transcutaneous pacing. All right, so symptomatic patients. That means they have signs and symptoms of a problem, yet they're hemodynamically stable. They have a wide QRS complex. This is the way that you're gonna work through this. The only exception here is that for atropine, the underlying rhythm cannot be second degree type two or third degree. Atropine won't work in those cases because as you remember, atropine works at the level of the AV node and the AV node is the one that's the problem, it's broken. It's not gonna transmit any impulses. I'm sorry, atropine works at the level of the SA node. The problem is at the level of the AV node. So essentially what you're gonna do with atropine is you're gonna make more sinus depolarizations occur, which means more P waves on the EKG, but none of them are getting through with high degree heart block. So they're never gonna increase the ventricular rate, which is what we're talking about when we talk about slow rhythms. All right, so commit this chart to memory. You can write it down. We'll talk about it in class, of course, um, and then we'll certainly apply them and you'll get this again in ACLS. So you'll have a lot of repeated exposure, but this is something you really, really need to commit to memory. All right, let's take a look at the other possibility here. The other possibility is that we have a fast rhythm. All right, and the fast rhythm, we're gonna do exactly the same thing. We're gonna look at unstable, and we're gonna look at stable patients. All right, and then remember, after we looked at the rate and whether or not they're hemodynamically stable, we wanna know if it's a narrow or wide. So guess what, narrow comes next, wide, stable over here. And then under narrow, we want to know, is the patient asymptomatic or do they have symptoms associated with this fast heart rate? If they're asymptomatic, guess what you're going to do? You're going to vomit the patient. If they're symptomatic, now we got to look at one additional component, and that is, what is the regularity of the rhythm? If the rhythm is regular 
and it's fast and it's narrow. We should be thinking SVT. SVT gets the treatment of Valsalva or vagal maneuvers first. Next, we give adenosine. All right, so fast rhythms that are stable, narrow, but the patient's symptomatic. They have chest pain, they're short of breath because of their narrow, fast rhythm with a decent blood pressure, and it's regular. We give vagal maneuvers first, then adenosine. If the patient is symptomatic and they have an irregular rhythm, you should be thinking AFib. So over here, we had SVT. If it's irregular, we should be thinking AFib. All right. AFib, we want to achieve rate control. We're not going to fix the irregularity, but if the AFib is at 180 beats per minute, it's fast, but the blood pressure is still good, but the patient has symptoms, we're going to rate control that with a calcium channel blocker, and Cardizem is what we're going to use for that. Remember, that's 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. All right, cool. So now we got to talk about this wide guy. Let me move this over just a smidge. So we have some uh, some additional room to work with here. All right, so let's do that. And we'll extend this line a little bit. All right, we'll put our wide guy here. And let's do the same thing. If we have a fast, stable, wide rhythm, we're going to consider lidocaine. And if we have access to it, or if that doesn't work, we're going to use amiodarone. All right, so this is a 150 milligram dose. This is a one milligram per kilo dose. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the unstable side of things here. All right, so unstable, we're going to do narrow. We're going to do regular. We're going to do irregular. All right, so again, same thing here. If you're thinking fast, unstable, narrow complex, and it's regular, you should be thinking SVT and atrial flutter. So here we should be thinking SVT or atrial flutter. All right, for the regular guys. Those are the regular guys that can cause problems. If they're unstable, the patient should receive electrical therapy. So think synchronized cardioversion. And for SVTs, we're looking at somewhere between 50 and 100 joules as the initial dose. All right, if that doesn't work, you're going to keep going up. If you did 50, you'd do 100 next. If you started 100, you do 200 next, then 300, then 360. All right, so this is this natural progression of increasing electrical energy to depolarize the heart. If the patient has a narrow, irregular rhythm, you should be thinking AFib. AFib. <clears throat> and if they're unstable, that means their blood pressure is low or they're having severe signs and symptoms. Remember, we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to do synchronized cardioversion, and we're going to start here at 200 joules. And if we need to, we'll go to 300. If we need to continue here because we didn't get resolution, we'll do 360. All right, so narrow, unstable, fast, think, A flutter, or SVT. You're going to do synchronized cardioversion at 50 to 100 as the initial dose, and then 200, 300, 360. If it's narrow and irregular, think A fib. A fib. Cardiovert, 200 joules is the starting dose for this. Why the difference in starting dose between SVT treatment and AFib? Answer is, in SVT, single isolated area of problems. It requires just a little bit of energy to overcome that. In atrial fibrillation, we might have hundreds or thousands of different little myocytes that are trying to assume the primary pacemaker capability, so we need to overcome a lot of muscle cells. We're going to do that by completely depolarizing the myocardial tissue all at once. Last but not least, we got to talk about this unstable wide presentation. So then the next thing you have to ask yourself is, does the patient have a pulse or no pulse? If the patient has a pulse with a wide, unstable, fast rhythm, think VTAC with a pulse. VTAC with a pulse? Synchronized cardioversion. You guessed it. Lots of muscle. All the ventricle tissue has to be depolarized. 200 joules, then 300, then 360 if needed. All right, so wide, unstable, fast rhythms. Think VTAC. VTAC with a pulse gets 
synchronized cardio version first. If you have a wide no pulse situation, think pulseless VTAC. Pulseless VTAC. In pulseless VTAC, we're going to defibrillate. Defibrillate. Defibrillation starts at 200 joules also, and it escalates 300 and 360. Now, we're also going to do some other stuff with drugs here. We'll talk about the entire algorithm uh, in class. I'm going to introduce those to you when we talk uh, ACLS world. All right, so for now, I just want you to think these... Uh, these different charts here, these flow charts, these are some things that you need to commit to memory. All right, so you can actually break these up however you want. You could actually redo both the slow and the fast charts the way I have them by starting out with stable or unstable and then breaking them down into fast and slow. You could start out by saying symptomatic or asymptomatic. It doesn't matter where you start on the flow chart. This just happens to be easy because this is completely ECG driven. So you look at the EKG and you can quickly determine is the EKG underlying rhythm, is it slow or is it fast? And then you look at the vital signs. Is it a stable or unstable patient? Because that immediately guides you down the right path. All right. So we'll talk extensively about these guys. Thanks for tuning in. And we'll talk about uh, all of these things in class.